Over the years, I've had a bunch of requests to make some sort of zombie apocalypse tutorial. And I didn't want to do the whole, you know, crowd of zombies just coming down a street thing. I wanted to make a whole short horror movie in Blender about zombies. So today I'm going to show you how I set up the environment, how I made the zombies, some cool extra effects like blood trails and interactive environments, and we'll even make some first person character arms. This video has been sponsored by Nvidia and Scan. As you can imagine, I've had a lot of requests over the years where people have asked me what sort of hardware I'd recommend for 3D work in apps like Blender. And especially if you don't know too much about computers, it can be really hard to figure out exactly what hardware you should buy to get the best bang for your buck. Now that's where Nvidia Studio Program comes to the rescue. Part of Nvidia Studio Program involves device certification. Now what that means is Nvidia actually takes away third party devices that have their graphics cards inside and they make sure that they not only have really good specs, but they actually put them through a whole bunch of tests to make sure that you get great performance in apps like Blender, Maya and Photoshop. Scan is one of the largest computing retailers in Europe and they have a whole section on their website just dedicated to RTX Studio devices. So you can pretty much guarantee that any device on one of those pages will give you really good results for any sort of digital content creation. Check out the link in the description to see Scan's whole range of RTX powered hardware. So the basic idea for this animation is that a guy is going to be breaking into a hospital to try and recover some anti-zombie vaccines of some sort. And spoiler alert, the hospital is full of zombies. I find the easiest way to make large buildings is to start out with a plane in top view and to draw out the floor plan by extruding edges. Once the basic shape is right, I go around with loop cuts and I add some lines where I want the thickness of the walls to go. Then you just need to select all those sections where the walls will be and extrude them up. To save a little bit of time on the doors, I used an add-on that comes with Blender called Archer Mesh. It has a bunch of elements like doors, windows, shelves and even suitcases. The doors come with a bounding box around them and that's really handy because you can use that as a boolean to cut out a hole for the walls. If you have the bool tool enabled which comes with Blender you just have to select that box, shift click on the wall and then press ctrl and number pad minus and it'll automatically remove that box from the wall and cut out the hole where the door should go. One second I just need to go and close that window. Bloody seagulls. An important detail that's often overlooked in interior scenes is to add some sort of trim or skirting board around the bottom of walls. I made this just by adding a loop cut around the whole wall section, then I selected this whole new part and I duplicated it out into its own object. Now you just have to press Alt E and extrude along normals to push out the skirting a little bit. Make sure you enable offset even in the options otherwise it'll all look a little bit wonky. If you wish, you can even add a little custom bevel shape to the top if you're feeling fancy. With the main layout done, I modelled a few basic elements like fire extinguishers and I placed them around the hospital. Feel free to just use downloaded meshes from places like Sketchfab if you want to, to save time. Right, let's move on to the good stuff, the zombies. I personally used a really great add-on that I love called Human Generator to make the base mesh of the zombies. I'll link to Human Gen somewhere in the description, but you can also just use free characters from the internet or you can make your own if you know how to do that. So once the character was in place, I used the Multi-Res modifier and I scumped it out some details under the mesh, just trying to make them look a little bit wrinkly and emancipated. I think I actually forgot to enable this for the final render, but it, it doesn't really matter. I wanted this guy to look like he was pretty recently deceased, so I used the material that automatically comes with Human Gen as a base and I just adjusted the colours and the materials a little bit, then I used a noise texture to create some bloody patches under the skin. I made sure that I had the optics viewport denoising enabled for this so I could actually see what I was doing without a bunch of noise getting in the way of all the textures and the details. Now I've done quite a few animations before from a character's point of view, but I've never actually added arms to them before. That's something I've wanted to try for ages, so this was a really fun experiment for me. I made another human gen character and I changed the rig to be a rigify armature. Then I just deleted all of the mesh apart from the torso and the arms. Then I parented that rig to the camera so that whenever I move the camera around the arms go with it. Now if you just select the rig and you go into pause mode you can easily add all sorts of animations for the arms and the finger movement. 
The general workflow that I followed for this was to go through it all in sections. I would keyframe out the character movements by keyframing the camera, then I would go through the whole shot again and I would add the keyframes for the character's arms. Now in the actual animation, I want the character to alert the zombies that he's there by knocking over a pile of boxes. Now Blender's rigid body system is a little bit crap frankly, but actually something like fallen boxes is fairly easy to do. The floor plane is given a rigid body system. Now we don't want any physics to actually act on the floor, so we're just going to set that to passive mode. Next I'm going to make a box and I'm going to give that a rigid body property as well. I don't want the boxes to be simulated until they're actually knocked over, so I'm going to keyframe this dynamic setting so it turns on at a certain point. This basically tells Blender when the rigid body physics should actually be active on this box. I'm also going to turn on deactivation. That tells the physics that once the box slows down to a certain speed, it should just turn off entirely. Otherwise, the boxes will all just spin around on the floor pretty much forever. Now I just have to duplicate the box a bunch of times and put it into a pile, and then I'm going to animate a cube to smash into it when I want them to fall over. Bake out that simulation, delete the cube that smashes into them, and you're all done. To get the right look and feel for the first person camera, I used a few different handy tricks. Firstly, I changed the camera type from perspective to panoramic, specifically fisheye equisolid. That gives us a camera that more accurately mimics the lens distortion of a real eye or camera. Once that was done, I turned on motion blur. And motion blur is really important to give us that proper sense of movement. You might have heard some people complain before that really high frame rate movies like The Hobbit look a little bit too smooth, almost like a cheap soap opera. That's because when you have higher frame rates, you naturally get less motion blur. So it's really important to turn on motion blur if you want more realistic movement in your animations. Now unfortunately motion blur does come at a fairly significant cost in terms of render time. However, if you have one of Nvidia's second generation RTX GPUs, you're in luck. Cycle supports GPU acceleration motion blur on those devices, which basically means you can just use motion blur to your heart's content and it's only going to have a tiny little impact on render speeds. You can also increase or decrease the amount of motion blur that you're going to get just by changing this slider in the motion blur settings. Some of the zombie characters and animations came from Adobe's free Mixamo website. It has a really nice library of characters, I use this thing all the time, and you can even use it to automatically add an armature rig to one of your own custom meshes as long as though they're in a humanoid shape. Now some of the characters were quite low poly and they did indeed a little bit of tweaking just to get them looking half decent. I also replaced this female zombie's hair with a proper dynamic hair particle system. Now blood trails are pretty easy to create in Blender and they actually look really nice. How I made this is I just selected an area of the floor that needed some blood and I created a whole new UV map just so it would have more resolution. And I scaled up the floor section on that UV map to cover as much space as possible. Then I gave the floor a dynamic paint property and I set that to canvas and I gave the zombie a dynamic paint property as well and I set that to brush. Now whenever the zombie touches part of the floor, it'll draw some paint onto the canvas. You just have to bake that out as an image sequence and we can use that to add the blood. In the shader settings for the floor, you can just create a new glossy material that looks kind of like blood. Add a mix shader and plug both the floor material and the blood material into it. Now we just need to add the image sequence that we baked out from the dynamic paint into the node setup I'm going to make sure that's using the correct UV map with a UV node. Then we just need to plug the alpha of that as the image sequence mix factor and that'll give us this nice effect where as the zombie crawls along the floor it leaves a trail of blood behind it. Now I didn't actually use this effect in my animation because it didn't really make sense that this old dried up crusty looking zombie would be bleeding so much but I thought you might want to know how to do this anyway in case you wanted to for instance have a character leave a bloody handprint on the wall. Now rendering this out was fairly easy. Interior scenes tend to be very noisy, but the objects rendering managed to get this done with just 450 samples on my system in about 20 seconds per frame. The optics denoiser did a really fantastic job of clearing up the noise which was there, and there was quite a bit to be fair with 450 samples, but I thought it actually looked pretty decent. Okay, so with all that done, let's check out the final animation. Rub to vaccination point, yes. Alright. This way. What? 
Overall, I'm pretty happy with how that one turned out. I didn't really leave myself enough time to refine the arm animation. It was a little bit tricky to get used to how that would actually look in a first person view. And if I had more time, I think I definitely could have done a better job. But hopefully, if you want to make something like this yourself in the future, you're gonna find this video helpful. If you do, please hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already. I really appreciate it when you do that. Make sure you check out the link in the description as well to see Scan's whole range of studio devices from Nvidia. They've got a really great selection of laptops, computers, and just GPUs.